This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Simon Phipps and I talk with Matthias Kirschner of the Free Software Foundation Europe, a really outstanding organization, very different from any other in the world, very effective, and about a new book that he's coming out with, or already is out in parts of the world and in some languages, Ada and Zangemann. It is a really great book. It's a really great show, and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 708, recorded Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022. Europe flies the Floss flag. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat that lets you listen in on two experienced technologists as they describe their building process and what they've learned from their experiences. Search for Code Comments in your podcast player. Hello, good morning, good evening, whenever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. Uh, And this week I'm joined by Simon Phipps himself. We can almost make an earth sandwich because we are, I think, 10 or 12 hours apart. We're opposite sides of the globe. Uh, Doc is in some beautiful, warm place with tropical birds outside the window. (laughs) And I'm sitting here in in the dark trying to work out whether I want to start the fan heater or not. (laughs) And... uh, Somebody is outside right now dragging a pallet, a skid. <laughs> so you can hear some of the noise in the background. This is Hawaii, as you can tell from my shirt. <laughs> and I'm here for just this week. Next week, I'll be back on what they call the mainland here. So so our our, our, our guest today, Matthias Kirschner, you brought him in, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, it's all my fault. Um, so uh, <laughs> Matthias runs Free Software Foundation Europe, which is um, the uh, the free software's uh, uh, head body in Europe, and it's quite different from the FSFE that you there's from the FSF that you might be used to in North America. Mm. Um, a much younger age profile, um, uh, a, quite a different approach to advocacy, and uh, the thing that's really fascinating is uh, Matas just wrote a children's book as a way of explaining what software freedom was to kids. It's and wonderful. So I, that I read it. Yeah. Just before Christmas, you know, everyone's out buying holiday gifts at the moment. His book is about to become available. We're a show. We ought to have people promoting books on this show. So yeah. here is yeah. here is a really interesting guy who's written a really interesting book, and he's on the show. So so let's let's get to it. Um, we're off to a bit of a late start for the usual technical reasons. So, um, uh, Matthias Kirschner, he'll go by Matthias or Matthias, depending on which one of us is talking here, is the president of uh, FSFE, the Free Software Foundation Europe. Uh, he helps other organizations, companies, and public administrators understand how they can benefit from free software, which is most of our uh, listeners and viewers know is is grants everyone the rights to use, study, share, and improve software. And how those rights help support freedom of speech, press, and privacy. He serves on the advisory board, boards, that's plural, of uh, different free software organizations. He's been a consultant to public bodies and other committees and regularly gives interviews, lectures, and participates in stuff like this <laughs> for better distribution of power in a democratic society. Welcome to the show, Matthias. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> so, 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 Matthias, I've... I've uh, I've read uh, I've read your book and um, <laughs> just this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, and and um, and and I'm wondering what you know what got you going. We, I know we got Ada going, your fictional child there in the in the book, um, but what got you going to write the book or in general about free no, software? Well, yeah. we could cover the book later, but I mean, uh, what's your what is the path by which you arrived at your advocacy of free software? I mean, the, the beginning was that I was, uh, so first of all, um, I got into computers from my father, where I also played around with them and programmed a little bit with them, like some, some basic uh, programming. And then later, um, I tried to convince my father that we should subscribe more newspapers so ca- I can inform myself from different sources. And my father said, oh, that's going to be too expensive. But I read something about the internet 
and I'll get you a modem and then you can inform yourself from different areas of the world. And uh, yeah, he got the modem and I think in the end it was more expensive, uh, but well, and uh, so I was one of the first ones in the school with, um, with internet connection at home, which was for me really great to see what is going on out there and what so many people are contributing. And, um, and then later I had a second computer at home and I connected the two of them and I wanted to send an email from one of the computers to the other computer. And both of them had email programs installed, but I somehow was not able to achieve it to send one email to the other without connecting uh, to the internet with the modem, which was still expensive. I complained about that in school and uh, then someone told me, oh, I have something for you. And a uh, day later I had a few CDs and floppies and that was my first GNU Linux distribution. And from there it started that I yeah, installed this, uh, fall in love with the command line because I didn't get X running for quite a while in the beginning. And um, yes, then um, over the time, I uh, I then like was setting up uh, Linux user groups. I met with others. We had installation parties. Went to free software events, and um, then I I discovered that um, all of that is also quite political, and um, that's how I then got started. That I I read um, articles uh, on the GNU pages, uh, some other uh, writings out there, and that's when I then realized. Wow, uh, it's not just a technical issue. It's uh, it's actually also um, an issue which is very important for for society, for our democracy. And uh, also, I couldn't say it at that time, but uh, I mean, for me, it's it's now um, in a democracy. We are distributing power, and it's important that not uh, that there is no single point with a lot of power. And I believe that free software is a very important component for a technical distribution of power and thereby a very important uh, stone in, in the foundation for a uh, working democracy. Right. Now, you're the president of uh, Free Software Foundation Europe. I think you're, you're maybe the third president that Free Software Foundation Europe has had. Um, yes. Tell me about the relationship between Free Software Foundation Europe and the Free Software Foundation that many of the American listeners and viewers are familiar with. So the Free Software Foundation was founded in uh, 1985 by Richard Stallman with uh, also the aim to, um, to create a free operating system and promote free software where all the components are, um, it's, uh, it's allowed to use, study, share and improve them. And in 2001, the Free Software Foundation Europe was founded with the same goals to promote free software, to um, to encourage the development of free software and to campaign for free software, but uh, with the um, with the context of a European organization. So um, the idea was to set up a network of free software foundations throughout the world, where each of those organizations, financially and personally, independent of each other, follow the same goals, but keep in mind where they are coming from. So for our side. Uh, uh, finding a European approach to to promote free software and um, reach people in in Europe about this. Right, and you've got some fairly distinctive campaigns that you're running in Europe. Do you want to tell us just a little bit about about those campaigns, particularly the you've got you, you, the shirt you're wearing has got one of them on. Uh, to tell us <laughs> about the the approaches that you're taking to advocacy because yeah. you're you're typically not tub something about how we, you've got to say free and not open source, and you're typically doing positive things that are campaigning for positive change. Tell tell <clears> us. Yeah, so there is, uh, I mean, with the shirt, it's public money, public code. That's a campaign framework we started. Um, by the FSFE and then got a lot of other organizations involved in this. The idea there is that um, we want that publicly financed software should be published under free software license. And what we did about that was we were setting up a, web, uh, setting up a website with, um, with arguments about that, with a video, with an open letter that you can sign when you support this, uh, this demand. And we created a brochure we translated all of those things in different languages. So you find all of that under publiccode.eu uh, with, with all the materials there. 
that's actually now the the website uh, on fsfe.org. But when you follow, then it's uh, it's the uh, public code. Uh, .eu website and what we are doing there as well is then we are reaching out to politicians for uh, before elections asking them about the positions there we answer uh, questions by politicians and public administrations we bring people from public administrations who want to promote free software who want to use it in their infrastructure together uh, in contact with other um, with other people who work in a different public administration in another country in Europe so that they can share experience, best practices, and um, maybe also come together to, uh, to do joint projects there. So that's one, one larger, uh, larger campaign we are running for a long time because we think that when, when taxpayers' money is used to create software, the whole society should benefit from that. Other public administrations should benefit from it. Companies should be able to benefit from it, and individuals should be able to benefit from it. Right. So and that, I, I particularly yeah. love that campaign, Matas, because um, you know by talking about public money and public code, using the word public instead of free or open, we're all able to join in and campaign on that subject. It's very inclusive, and there's a there's a big circle of organisations and individuals in Europe who are all able to join in with that. Was, was that intentional on your part to try and make sure that it could use it a language that could mm. have a, a, a wider uh, community working on it? I mean, the, the main idea was before we worked on many different aspects on like we were following migrations to proprietary software or to free software like the Linux uh, project in, in, in Munich, some other uh, public administrations who used free software and then not used free software anymore. And um, the idea was, how do we find, um, how, how can we phrase the idea of uh, the importance of, of free software for public administrations in a way that it's easy to, to understand, easy to grasp. And um, like, if you first have to explain what is, uh, what is free software, what is open source software, you might lose uh, a few uh, valuable time to convince people. And we thought that when it's public money, public code, that public code is a good synonym there for free software or open source software. And that many people are then able to, to as you said, join in there and contribute and use this uh, campaign framework in their own work. And that's also, I think, one of the big advantages there, as you said, that meanwhile, there are so many organizations out there who use slides about public money, public code, who show the video, who use this when advertise, uh, when promoting their work towards public administrations or the public. So the idea there was really to make it possible for many organizations and individuals to join and reuse materials. Yes. Right, right. Now, yesterday you started uh, another campaign about uh, the freedom to use software on any device. Do you want, want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's coming from, I mean, we are already working in this area for, for a longer time. It's, um, we have a campaign called upcyclingandroid.org. And um, there the idea is to explain people um, how uh, about sustainability and, and software and to encourage them to think about how long to use certain devices, in this case, a mobile phone, and how much we could save as, uh, as humankind in electronic waste if we would just be able to use our phones one year or two years longer. And that's a, a project which is financed by the German um, Agency for um, Environmental Protection. And we are doing workshops there to show people how to install alternative ROMs on their phones, be it um, and other Android ROMs um, or also post-market OS or other GNU Linux systems. And we help them bring, bring devices there so that they can hack and test that out and also lose a little bit the fear of flashing another operating system on your, on your device. And oh, yeah. from, this, from this campaign, what we... Um, what we now started there was uh, we we um, opened we already had an open letter for a while open for signatures by organizations but there were so many people who said that they would also like to sign that as individuals that we now uh, brought this up for um, individual donors as well so the idea there is that 
you should have the universal right to install any software on any device or also remove any software from any device so that you have more control over your own uh, devices, that you are able to choose between different service providers to connect your device to, that you are um, able, for example, to exchange the the app store or the browser or um, yeah, the services um, like the uh, speak, uh, speech recognition or whatsoever. And that, um, that those devices are then interoperable and compatible with, with open standards. And that for your devices, you also get the code for drivers, tools, interfaces, uh, that they are all published under a free software license. Right, right. So that's the demand there. Um, long way ahead of us, <laughs> but uh, it's a start. So uh, we could talk about s several of the campaigns. Um, you've got uh, your Root of Freedom campaign to help people uh, be able to connect to the internet without having to be intermediated by their ISP. Um, you've got you've also got a member of staff who works on European policy. Um, how is all this funded, Matthias? Because mm -hmm. you've got you know I was at SFSCon with you last week. You had like <laughs> eighteen people with you. How where, where how are you funding all this? I mean, from the 18 people you met there, uh, part of them were volunteers. <laughs> Some of them are also then staffers, but they are part time. So, but yes, uh, we we finance ourselves um, first of all through donations. So over one third of our income is through donations uh, by um, sustaining members, uh, our supporters. So they um, they are individuals who are donating to us for um, for our work. Then there are companies who are donating to us. And um, then the other part are then some uh, project funding, like now with Upcycling Android from the German Agency for Environmental Protection, or we are also participating in um, EU projects, um, Horizon Europe, where we are part of a consortiums when when people apply and do free software projects and which are funded by the European Commission, then um, we help them with uh, legal questions around free software licensing issues and help them to to make sure that in the end, the public money which is spent there is actually also public code free software. And um, so that's another part of the funding, plus then some uh, some funding through sponsorships for events, which right. is a smaller part there. You can find out all about our um, our finances and uh, the sponsors when you go on our website under about and then transparency commitment, where you can see all the uh, the income, the cash flow, and uh, our donors. That's right. all all listed there. Now, uh and just had up the um, the legal support page, which I think is quite a significant part of what you do, uh, because uh, you know you're not just an advocacy organisation. You've also created a reuse framework to help people to mm. get the licensing information right on on code that you're working with. Uh, you run a big international network of legal experts that's got everybody's general counsel on, so that we can um, we can raise legal issues um, between organisations and between companies. Um, uh, how, how big a part of your work is your your legal activity? It, it, are you kind of fifty fifty uh, for civil society and legal, or are you much more about um, legal issues as an organisation? Would you say? I mean, the, the three areas are public awareness, so general informing the public about free software. The other one is policy, and then there is legal. And the distribution between those three areas, it's um, it's changing from time to time. So depending on what campaigns uh, um, or yeah, what what activities we have at the moment, which are are more pressing there. I mean, at the moment in the in the legal part, we have uh, one full time position. Uh, one and a half full-time positions for for a lot of the legal work plus uh, some hours for the uh, for the reuse uh, work. yeah I would say another like 30 percent for for reuse uh, 30 percent of a full-time employee so in total almost two of uh, two full-time positions are uh, on on our legal side but to to understand that uh, I mean the the FSFE is also as an organization heavily run by volunteers. So we have the staff, but uh, they are there and we, we need them for a lot of uh, things where it's sometimes 
more difficult to involve um, to involve volunteers. For example, if it pops up, oh, next week there is an important uh, debate, an important meeting in Brussels in the Commission. We need to send someone there to represent us. Then that's something which is very difficult for a volunteer to. Um, in this short time frame then to prepare for the meeting, go there and represent uh, the interests of software freedom there. Um, but beside that, there are many, many volunteers who, who coordinate activities, who do translations, they, they run the activities in the different European countries. They, um, they take care about website, about, um, about the development of new tools. Like uh, we were recently we developed, uh, we participated in a, in a competition by the European Commission um, about public procurement data. And uh, one of our volunteers together with a working student at that time started a project called Detective, where you can um, enter, um, you can find out, for example, how much money, uh, how many tenders did Microsoft Germany GmbH get from, from public administrations for what? You can find out who was involved on those tenders and we we built a prototype for that and in the end actually uh, even won the the first award in in this category for more transparency in public procurement and there it's also it wouldn't have been possible without without the help of uh, volunteers again who were starting all of that so so i i have a couple a couple of additional questions, which uh, one of which involves funding and, and activism in general and mm -hmm. kind of going further in that. But first, I have to let people know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat. You know, when you're working on a project and you leave behind a small reminder in the code, a code comment to help others learn from your work, this podcast takes that idea by letting you listen in on two experienced technologists as they describe their building process. There's a lot of work required to bring a project from whiteboard to development, and none of us could do it alone. The host, Burr Sutter, is a red hatter and a lifelong developer advocate and a community organizer. In each episode, Burr sits down with experienced technologists from across the industry to trade stories and to talk about what they've learned from their experiences and I've listened to some of these. I subscribe. Uh, it's really good. There's one I just listened to on the subject of networking and the history of networks, where networks are going. I recommend that. All episodes are available anywhere you listen to podcasts and at redhat.com slash code comments podcast. All one word, code comments podcast. Search for code comments in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to code comments for their support. So, Matthias, I was, I was looking at the about page uh, you were mentioning earlier. Um, it, it, there's a, a roster of pretty much every, uh, every name brand, you might say, advocacy group there. It's also great seeing uh, uh, Greg uh, Crow Hartman's face there as one of your uh, <laughs> members and supporters. He was on the show last week and on the show ah. last week. And it was great. I recommend checking that out. He's, he's awesome. Um, and, and no corporate sponsors. And, and is that a bylaw that you have no corporate sponsors or is that um, is that a choice at your end uh, at the FSFE? I'm just I'm wondering how that works. Um, and none is a good I answer. To... I, I run a nonprofit that doesn't allow corporate contributions. Mm -hmm. So I know what that that's about. I, I'm I'm not sure which which page you you then ended up. I, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Uh, at the FSFE, not like with... I don't know which yeah. one. Anyway. The, the so when you when you go on, well, when, it's, when it's, you go to, to, go ahead. We're talking over each other. Latency <laughs> at work. <laughs> yes. So uh, if you go to the about page and then uh, in the transparency commitment, you see like what uh, fine about our finances, and there you also see our donors. And um, there are other pages there about our uh, associated organizations. Like when you go to donations or. Maybe the shorter one is go go back, um, go to donations. I oh, know. Actually, go to sorry, <laughs> sorry. For those but this watching, is also an important yeah, page. Our producer uh, is is now who donates to us Un under under donations. There is who donates to us. Yes, and there you see the the donors uh, there. Okay, this and there you also great. see we we have corporate donors as well. 
and um, so that's uh, that's not something that uh, we we don't uh, accept. So as I mentioned before, one over one third of our income is uh, through um, through our supporters, and then the other parts is a, a large part then about the donations by uh, companies um, who are also supporting our work there. Mm -hmm. I, I and I'm wondering. I mean, I I, I don't say. There's a sort of principle that says that, you know, follow the money and you find out what the influence is. Um, yeah. how, how do you deal with that? Because you got Huawei and you have Google on that page. Mm. And those, those two in particular, for different reasons, are often accused of having corporate influence. And I wonder how you mm. either get around that or just ignore it. it. It seems to be your principles are so strong that ignoring mm. it is not a hard thing to do. Um, but yeah, no, tell us a little about that. I mean... With every donation, you are influenced. So that's that's clear. Um, what we try to do is um, we, first of all, we are aware about this, that um, when companies are donating to you or also large individuals are donating to you, that this can have an influence on, on our work. So the first thing we do about that is we have exactly that page so that uh, everyone out there can have a look where our money is coming from and uh, we encourage everyone who has a look at that and also our activities and thinks that we are doing something um, in a way because we might have received money from one of those companies or we are not doing certain things because we have received money from one of those companies that everyone out there can help us to raise those questions so that we can then reflect on them on our own again. So that's very important for me because I think uh, in organizations, you often, um, when you just think about it on your own, you might somehow justify some things. And for the FSV, it's important that there are outside triggers for discussions, even if that sometimes might feel uh, for the organization itself like some people spinning up some conspiracy theories, <laughs> but it's it's still a very important um, a very important trigger there that you then have to think about that was that really something that had an influence? Might we be influenced too much about this? Um, so those are very important discussions we regularly have. The other thing that we have is we have a financial reserve which is bigger than any of the um, of the donations we have, uh, we receive from the companies. So if any of the donors will stop funding us, we still have enough money there that this will not be immediately a problem for us, but that we have several months to compensate and find other solutions for the, uh, for the lose of the money there. And the other part is that our aim is always to gather the money which we need the next year already by the end of the year before. So we are now at the moment um, finding the money for our budget next year, and then we can operate quite uh, independently of, of uh, additional income there. So that's always our goal. And the other thing is that um, we have several very principled people in the organization who, um, who always make clear towards uh, donors that a donation is a donation that means that yes we will list you on this website also for transparency reasons but that there is nothing you get in return beside this we mention people but you will not be allowed to participate in um, in strategy meetings or other meetings in a different way than anyone else out there so if we are um, discussing a new topic we will find out the stakeholders there, but there is no preference of uh, donors towards other organizations out there who have uh, will have a good input there. And from time to time, there are then also <laughs> situations where you have to tell people that, um, yes, uh, that they are asking for something in return. And... Um, in those cases, we also explain them that, um, yeah, that's not how it's going to work at the FSFE. For example, recently we had uh, uh, we had an event and uh, there was uh, um, one of the sponsors of the event contacted us and uh, said, oh, yeah, we are sponsoring the event. The call for papers is already over. Would it still be possible to, um, to have a speaking slot there? And our reply then was... Um, 
well, if you wouldn't be a sponsor, it wouldn't be a problem at all. We could just accept you. But because you are a sponsor, we now have to call a uh, talk with the jury about that if we can allow you to to still submit something there. So and by by doing this and uh, yeah, repeatedly clarifying that um, the uh, for the FSFE, one of the most important values is to be neutral from um, from company interests. This is uh, something that we that we constantly work on to make sure that we, um, yeah, that we can act in a way that we think is best for software freedom and not what uh, some companies might think is is good for their well, own that's a, for software freedom. That's, that's a more than complete answer, and I thank you for that. Um, I, I want to say, what it, it, uh, add to what um, what Simon already said about. Uh, your advocacy of free software being, and I hate to say this because I love the FSF here in the US, but one reason open source became a thing was because it was really hard to explain free software. I think making the public money, public code, they're so interesting because, um, because I mean, I, I think you're doing an awesome job of, of branding free software. I mean, it, it, it didn't happen in the US. I don't think it happened elsewhere very well, which is why open source became a thing. Um, but I like, you know, public, public doesn't have to mean in the US, there's this notion that there's a public sector and a private sector and the public sector is government. And mm -hmm. it's not in your case, it's uh, the, the idea is the public is the public, and the public is people, and the free software is for people. And it's for everything people do, including making stuff and making stuff work and keep working. And that just strikes me as an extraordinarily appealing thing. And, and I love the way that um, you're addressing kids and young people. And for the most part, it seems like your constituency is young as well, uh, where, as Simon joked earlier, we tend to be gray beards over here. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, do, you, do you see this becoming a, a part of the general young people's movement that I think there's kind of worldwide agreement right now um, is the best hope for the world, you know, as with the, our economies are, especially with the environment and other things like that. Um, are, are you, do you sort of see it that way? I mean, is it a, I mean, here it feels like an old people's movement. I hate to say that, but it, it does. Mm -hmm. It's free software, but it, I, do you see it as primarily a young people's thing? I'm projecting that because I want it to mm. be that. But so now I'm I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure about that. So in in Europe we have the same problem that uh, to find new people contributing to free software projects, uh, find new people who get active in organizations who promote software freedom out there, and um, so that's something where I think in in general. Um, we, we have those challenges to, to encourage young people to get active there. But I think that, um, that is something that, I mean, for quite a while, people argued, yeah, the, the younger people, they are not uh, political and they don't want to get active. I, I think with Fridays for Future and, uh, and other movements, we recently saw that, uh, well, they, they proved this wrong. So they want to shape their future. And um, they want to have an active role in society, not just a passive role. And in order in, in nowadays a society to shape your future, you need to, sh you need to shape technology. You, uh, technology is shaping so many areas in our society. So you need to be able to understand how this environment works. You need to be able to make modifications to that, to adopt it to to fit your goals and that's why i think that a lot of the a lot of the um a lot of the younger people who want to shape the future and take an active role in society that they are um, a very good group of uh, people whom you can encourage to also get active and and uh, in in free software to understand those tools to um, to influence those as well and I mean that's that's one one thing which I think still needs a lot of a lot of work um, to to reach those um, those younger generations we um, at the uh, we just had the last month's uh, coding competition youth hacking for freedom where we had uh, 14 till 18 year olds 
competing uh, with free software projects who then afterwards uh, were invited to an award ceremony and had um, um, and got some prize money for their own projects in the future. And that was something for me, which was like, I just thought, wow, uh, what they are doing there. And when you talk with them about what that they want to do good for society and and what their ideas are that was that was so motivating for me and so encouraging to to continue with this and and explaining them helping them to understand how free software can help them to um to follow their ideas to to shape the future um without a dependency on gray beard <laughs> and uh And that's also one of the, the reasons with the with the children's book uh, that um, I think it's important to reach um, people at a very early age and explain them the advantages of free software and get them interested in technology to to tinker with technology to to um, self determined use technology and thereby, as I said, be able to to have an active role in society. Right, right. So, you know, that's a great segue into thinking about uh, the, the book that you've written. Uh, now, it, it, you know, I've, I've had a read of your book. I unfortunately don't have any children uh, the right age to read it to. My children are all about your age. Um, and uh, uh, my, my grandchildren are still too young to uh, really enjoy the finer points of it, although they will listen to it being read to them. What what made you write the book? You know, what was your what was your motivation for writing it was were you telling hmm. stories to a child or you know, where did it come from hmm. so at the uh, at the beginning i thought how can i explain to my own children what am i doing there why do i think that uh, free, uh, free software is important how can i explain them what software is and why it matters what the difference between software and hardware is And um, that was in 2017. I asked on the mailing list of the FSFE, do you have any recommendations for younger children? And um, then I got some replies there and either the suggestions were for older um, children, so rather from 12 years upwards or so, or I didn't like them so much. <laughs> so what I did then was I started um, as good night stories to just invent a few, um, a few stories and just every evening I came up with something and, uh, and then based on the feedback, I mean, one good thing with children is that they have very direct and uh, good feedback there. You, um, I was then further developing this and included some ideas they had and said, oh yeah, but this would also be great. And then, okay, let's include, a. Uh, let's include skateboards uh, and oh yeah, they're now it's it's summer. We need to include ice cream as well. So I I included more and more in this and um, and then I at one point figured out well maybe the direction in which this is going that might some might be something that's not just uh, fun and educational for my own children or a good tool to talk with them about all those topics I care about and where I, where I would also like to see that they are. Um, starting their life well prepared for the challenges ahead of them that uh, I thought maybe maybe it might be good to to do a book about that and at the beginning I thought maybe self-publish that <clears throat> and then I was uh, very lucky because when I talked with a person about that um, and he said that I'm, I'm thinking about writing a, a book for children that uh, he said well if you do this then I will buy 1,000 copies and and uh, give that to customers of us. And yeah, as I knew that, then I, I knew, okay, I will get probably, I will have some funding available and then the FSFE agreed that I can um, use some money to, to get um, an editor involved, uh, specialized in children's books. And then I started working <clears throat> with the editor on a script. Then from there on, uh, then thought, okay, um, What do I do about self-publishing, publishing? And uh, yeah, I heard a lot of stories about how difficult this is. And somehow I was very lucky because I thought, okay, what would be the, the best publisher I could imagine for him at that time, the, the German book of the, uh, of the story. And uh, then I thought, okay, I'll, I'll write to O'Reilly before I do anything else. And three hours later, I had a reply, let's have a phone call. 
And uh, yeah, from there on, then the, the discussion <laughs> continued and they were very interested in this and uh, lots of things still to discuss, especially also with uh, the Creative Commons licensing, which we choose for the book. But yeah, from, from there on, it, it then continued that I uh, then worked with, uh, with the editor. I found an illustrator for the book and then uh, also worked with the editors from, the, from uh, O'Reilly and further developed that. <clears throat> and yes, then last year in December, we had the German version. And then afterwards, I continued with the English version. And um, I'm very happy that uh, No Starch Press agreed to publish the book. And um, yes, now from December on, the book will be available to buy in the US uh, in English as well. So, Excellent. And, and you did a Ukrainian this. version as well, because I know you, you <laughs> my son lives in Ukraine and you, you sent uh, one of the local charity leaders in his area a big shipment of them. Why did you do a, a Ukrainian version? <laughs> um, so at the FSFE, we, we had a discussion when there were uh, so many refugees in Europe uh, from, from the Ukraine. Um, we thought about, okay, is there anything that we can do? And uh, then we had this idea, maybe when, when there are lots of children who, who come, uh, they had to flee, they, they don't, uh, aren't able to take a lot of things with them. It might be a nice idea to, to hand them a book in their native language so that they have a, a book again. And um, there again, uh, we were very lucky that um, uh, Reinhard Wiesemann was uh, the person who said that, uh, well, that sounds, that sounds really great. If you do this, I will finance the translation and the printing of the book. And um, it was also clear at that time that there will probably no be, won't be a commercial publisher for the Ukrainian version for quite a while. So, um, yeah, we then created this translation. We printed 2,750 copies and then distributed that to um, organizations working with refugees, with some organizations in, um, in Ukraine, like your, your sons and uh, then send them around that they are then distributed. We also had some, some readings organized by uh, organizations where there were Ukrainian artists reading the book and we had discussions with them. So that was the idea there that we can make a very small contribution there and, and help them to, yeah, to have a, a book on their own again in their hands. And so, actually, so, so, um, oh, yeah. Carry on. Actually, uh, at the moment, uh, in, in the next days, we will also uh, ship uh, 7,000 books in uh, the same book in Arabic because uh, after the success with the Ukrainian version, there were also people who said that, well, there are many refugees also who speak Arabic and uh, if we can't also enable this. And yes, that's why we now also have an Arabic version, which we will um, distribute in the next days. I mean, that's all very exciting. Uh, you know, I was talking to Doc about this and we wondered who the characters are. You know, Ada sounds like <laughs> she might be named after Ada Lovelace, but uh, Doc pointed out that Zangerman sounds like uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk all rolled into one without being any of them. So who who would you say were the inspirations for your characters? I, I, I would say that the names you mentioned, plus a few others <laughs> who, who are also out there, that's definitely people whom I encountered in, in my work for Free Software Foundation Europe and where I then thought, okay, what, what are some of those characteristics? How can you combine that? And yes, yeah, so I, the, the funny thing is always <laughs> I'm, I'm asked, a lot of people, they tell me like, oh, it's so clear who it is. And then I ask like, who is it? And uh, then <laughs> the funny part there is that they mention different people. They mention it's clear that it's Steve Jobs, it's Mark Zuckerberg, it's Elon Musk, it's Teal, it's whoever. So, um, yeah, I, I'm quite happy with that outcome. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> good, the, good the, the name was good also work. something that was uh, really, really fun because I, that was one of the things I struggled really for a long time. And I had for a long time in my, in my script, there was dollar name for the, uh, for Sangerman. And uh, the other names were really, they were not good, which I tried. And then one day when I was reading this again, the, the current script to, to my children, uh, my older son said, no, he's, he's called Zangenmann. And I said, why, how, how do you come to, to this idea? And he said, 
I I tra I had a dream this night about about the book, and there he was called Zangenmann. And I thought like, wow, that's that's very good because uh, yeah, it's it's in German it fits very well with the the Zange, which is like um, pincer. And uh, so I thought that that's really nice. And then in the editing process, uh, we in the process sometimes forgot the N after Zangenmann, and then it was Zangenmann, and then we thought, hmm, actually might even be better. And uh, also from the uh, Actually, it's it's not a name. So Zangenmann is something which you find, but Zangenmann is something you don't find anywhere. At very few people. <laughs> so we thought that that's that's good. So that there is nobody out there who uh, will then be the bad person or someone uh, people <laughs> associate with something that they don't have anything to do with. So it's so all fictional alert. characters. <laughs> spoiler alert for the readers: uh, you know, Zangenmann is unredeemed. Uh, do you do you feel that that's correct? Do you feel that people who insist on lock-in and walled gardens are beyond redemption? Does is that the the meaning of the end of the book for adults, or do you feel that there is actually hope in the sequel that you're going to write next? <laughs> <sighs> for, for me, it was important with the ending of the book that it ends in a way that people think about the topic more. And I didn't want to, to make the, the ending of the book to predict too much what is happening and, and cut too much of the discussion you can have with people with, who, who read the book or whom you read the book. So that, I mean, in general, with the, with the, other, um, the other parts of the book as well. So I... I try to make it in a way that it's very open towards uh, you as uh, the person who discusses this topic with others to think about how you want to discuss um, issues there and what uh, topics you want to discuss there. That's also why it, it's quite open what is happening with Sangeman or why he's acting this way, because I think that's very interesting questions you you can talk about. And actually also questions not just to talk about with with children, because one of the <laughs> feedbacks that I I received was, I, I first thought it's a it's a children book, but then people told me yes, I I gave that as a present to to my parents, and now finally they understand why I'm do, uh, doing all this work for for free software there, or um, they say well I I gave it as a present to my boss. I think he finally understood why software freedom matters and, and why we should use more free software in our company. And uh, so it, it's not just the, the discussions with, with children, but also with adults. Oh, and, and actually, yes, also for, for politicians. We, we also gave that as a present to some politicians already. And we, um, a few days ago, there was actually the public reading aloud day in Germany where... Um, People go to schools and they read books there. And two members of the uh, of the German Parliament, they choose the German version of Ada and Sangerman, went to schools and read it out there. And uh, I think had also quite interesting discussions about monopoly, self determined use of technology, um, democracy, and all of that. So, yes. So, so I'm wondering, that as we're getting short on time now, um, uh, in in the stuff you've said that I've um, that I've read, something that stands out to me is interesting, and I'd like to know more about is what is the next generation internet that you're talking? Is it a different protocol hmm. completely, or is it just better behavior by the intermediators that are out there? I'm just uh, wondering. Next generation, next generation internet is a. Uh, um, that's a program by the European uh, Commission to support um, uh, to support the development of new technologies. So it's in the research and development uh. area that uh, the European Commission wants to encourage um, new approaches there for new internet technologies. And then there are different programs focusing on on s uh, different aspects like uh, like networking or like more privacy and and other aspects there. So that's the um, that's a EU funded um, uh, EU funded project and we are consortium partners there together with other organizations to help 
um, projects who are applying there and got accepted and with different aspects. So there are people who help uh, with UX design. There are people who help with security. There are uh, then the FSFE is helping them with all kind of legal and licensing questions so that uh, they know, uh, can I combine this free software license with that free software license? How do I um, make it clear that this is actually free software? So they will bring in reuse.software with those very easy to understand recommendations to make sure that your software is not just out there and uh, available uh, uh, with the source code, but it's actually under free software license so that you can then also exercise the rights to use, study, share, and improve the code. And, and that's leading to some great outcomes. Uh, you know, that that project, uh, Doc, Doc was not completely aware about NGI, actually, uh, Matthias. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he, was he was wanting I you to no comment idea. on uh, what comes next and whether it has Bitcoin in it. And uh, and but fortunately, fortunately, instead of talking about Bitcoin, you talked about NGI. NGI is doing some great work. Uh, it's it's partly funded by EU grants. It's partly funded by a charity called NLNet in in the Netherlands, um, and it's leading. It's it's what's led to some of the software that is now suddenly becoming popular on the Fediverse and and becoming uh, uh, published out there. So very well worth looking into. If uh, any, if if you're working on software in Europe at the moment, uh, NGI might well be able to fund your brilliant uh, next idea. Um, so, you know, where do you think software is going in the future in in Europe, Matthias? Uh, I see a Europe where the uh, the old industries and the old ideas of competition have very much got control of both the markets and the strings of power. Uh, and I see the work that I, I'm doing with OSI and the work that you're doing with mm -hmm. FSFE as both being uh, crucially important. And yet uh, um, we haven't found really found a rock to put the lever that is going to move the world yet. Uh, how hopeful are you that we can prevent the next generation of Europe being um, a, 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 like a, 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 the pods in the matrix being harvested for money by big corporations? Mm. I, I always have some difficulties to predict the future, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm uh, in in almost all my talks. I'm I'm using a, a quote which one of my teachers once wrote down for me. It says, uh, "Many small people in many small places do many small things that will change the face of the world," and that's that's also my approach there. That uh, well. I don't know what will happen. Maybe there are some times where it's worse again for software freedom than it has been in some years. Um, but I mean, what does that change? It's still something that uh, I myself, the FSFE, we will continue to work for software freedom as well as uh, you, the OSI, many other organizations out there are doing. And um, it's in the end, we also have it in our hands uh, what what will happen there and it's something where when you when you think about political decision makers the organizations working for software freedom they need to be able to do this work they need uh, better financial support to do this they also need other um, people contributing with their free time because it's in the end when when politicians or decision makers hear something about uh, about other topics there it's uh, the first time they might think, yeah, well, hmm. But then when they hear it again and again and again, they will think more about that. And then there will be new, younger advisors to decision makers who grow up where it's way more normal that you have software freedom and this should be something and it's not so abstract anymore and so so far away. And um, so I, I'm the part which makes me optimistic is that there are people out there who are really dedicated to work on these topics um, and want uh, are working for software freedom there and the other part is also that in the for the decisions makers there is also a generational change there and there are more people getting in roles of uh, influencing decisions who are way more sympathetic and way more positive about uh, free software who way better understand that free software is something very important for our democracy that we need to distribute power that we cannot have just a few companies who control what we can and what we cannot do with technology but that we need to distribute that and that we need to 
have a digital sovereignty of, of governments. And so those are things which are also pushed more and more. While, of course, there are those, uh, those, um, those topics popping up where you think like, wow, it feels like we now did two steps forward and uh, now it's the four steps back again. And then the important thing is, from my perspective, not to stop, but try to make eight steps in front again. <laughs> That's very optimistic, and I, I'm I'm really happy with this. Um, we're about out of time, so we always close with uh, with two questions. Um, you've covered the other questions. I think we already would have had. <laughs> One is, what is your favorite text editor and scripting language? So yes, I I am using the editor of the beast. So and that's something where I spend most of my time, and so it's. Uh, Wi or Wim, the text editor and uh, scripting language. I yeah, I did some bash. I I did a little bit of Python, but I'm I'm not uh, so often uh, programming myself. So uh, there are great tools out there. And but I yeah, I I love Python and I love Bash. Well, that's great. So. Thank you so much for being on the show. I, I want everybody to go buy the book, get the T-shirts, look at what the FSFE is doing. I, I love, I love, I really love everything that you're doing. I'm, I'm very encouraged by it. So, thanks so much for being on the show. We'll have to have you back again to talk progress. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> so, Simon, that was good. And thanks for carrying yeah. the weight on that one. I, I, I had to be riding mute. Now it's quiet in the background. I, I had trucks going by. I had a guy under the window hosing out buckets with a power hose. <laughs> so, it's always the way, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, I knew you. I thought you 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 would love that because uh, you know to start with, you know, you're an author and and you appreciate a a well targeted book. And and I think that Matas's book is is well targeted. And he's obviously hit a nerve with it because it's being picked up in Germany and elsewhere. And, um, you know, I, I will put in the show notes where people can get it from. They can get it from No Starch Press in the US. And there's a, a, a discount code available for you to, to get it. And I'm hoping it's going to be shipped in time for uh, the holidays. Um, but I, also the wider organization. You know, I work with FSFE quite a lot um, in doing European policy work. They have some great staff. They're always very f uh, positive and friendly. They've had some big challenges to deal with over the last decade. So, you know, I think th you, you've got a great story there, and I think it will be well worth getting Matthias back. Also, some of his colleagues, uh, like Alexander Sander, who does their policy work, would have some fascinating things to say about what's going on with technology policy in Europe and its relationship with software freedom. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged. and. Uh... And I have, to, I have to admit, I did not know that much about the FSFE. I mean, I knew it existed. I didn't know much more. Um, and uh, I, I, I've, I've sort of despaired where we are in the U.S., sort of in general anyway, uh, where we don't talk politics here, but basically we just have an extreme right and extreme left, and the rest of it is all just noise. And it seems like there's really constructive stuff going on in, in, in Europe in general, and they're part of it. And... Um, it's, it's a model for the world. Um, and uh, anyway, just I'm, I, I'm, I'm just digging it and uh, I, I want to know more. Yeah, they've got some really cute merchandise as well, I have to say. Uh, the, so my favorite thing they've got is they have a, a, a children's sized T-shirt that says on it, I am a fork that uh, every kid <laughs> ought, ought to go buy I love that. The kids. Yeah. So they, <laughs> I they, also they have love a that. Uh, they have a baby bib and they have a uh, and a t-shirt that says it, which I think is great. <laughs> I, I also love that um, uh, that uh, that his kid named Zangaman. <laughs> I think that, yes. that was yes, that's excellent. <laughs> it's also funny. Say, oh no, I blame the kid. You <laughs> know, the kid came up with it. Um, so uh, next week we we have Jason Griffey on um, and. Uh, and uh, on my notes here say, Doc in Hawaii, I'm not in Hawaii next week. I will be back on the mainland with a better connection with Ethernet, with windows closed <laughs> in my office. 
that is the plan. So, um, so enthused about that. And Tim Pozar the week after that, and uh, others, uh, other great ones coming up as well. So, any any plugs? We've already plugged the FSFE pretty well. And yeah, yeah. For the OSI, yeah, or you know, we've we've got to help their fundraising at this time of year. Uh, you know, the the only thing I'd note is uh, apparently something happened at Twitter recently. I I don't quite know what, and suddenly my account on 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 the Fediverse. Uh, which and you should say Fediverse rather than Mastodon because there's lots of different apps on the, in the right. Fediverse. Yes. Suddenly my yeah. account has gone has gone absolutely crazy, and I've got loads of activity there. And I'd encourage anyone who's uh, who's listening to to go look for me on the Fediverse. You'll find me on mesh.cloud slash webmink, um, and uh, I, I would I'd love to see you over there. And there's lots and lots of very well tempered, very eloquent very uh, enjoyable conversations going on that really n could n not happen on Twitter anymore. There, there's too much sniping on Twitter for that to happen. So do come join us uh, on Mastodon or on the Fediverse. And um, I look forward to seeing you there. That's a, that's a good distinction. And um, I just have a note out there for everybody who's doing a story on Mastodon. And this is still with full respect for the Fediverse. A Mastodon and a woolly mammoth are not the same. Um, show a picture of a mastodon, okay? Not a woolly mammoth. They all show a woolly mammoth. I don't know why. They're more interesting looking probably, and they have <laughs> they have fancier tusks, or they had. <laughs> and there are more of them frozen in the tundra that are thawing out as global warming progresses. But mastodons are different. <laughs> so show the, show the right thing. Anyway, so it's a, a, a kind of, yeah, there we go. No, there's a woolly, yeah, uh, yeah, mastodons different. <laughs> so, uh, Wikipedia has a good picture of both of them together. Um, that, that should make clear what the, what the difference was <laughs> because they're both gone <laughs> anyway. So, so thanks a lot, Simon. This has been a great show. And, uh, and again, we'll see everybody next week, um, uh, for, uh, for Jason Griffey. That'll be a good one. Take it easy, everybody. Hey folks, I'm Ant Pruitt. And what do you get your favorite tech geek that has everything? A Club Twit gift subscription, of course. Twit podcasts keep them informed and entertained with the most relevant tech news podcasts available. With the Club Twit subscription, they get access to all of our podcasts ad free. They also get access to our members only discord, access to exclusive outtakes, behind the scenes and special content such as AMAs, which I just love hosting. Plus, exclusive shows such as Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows, and the Untitled Linux Show. Purchase your geek's gift at twit.tv slash club twit, and it will thank you every day.